yeah hi guys welcome to today's mcq discussion mcq discussion number 19 so let's get started with the first question true regarding mitochondrial genome disease inheritance so which of the following is true regarding mitochondrial genome disease inheritance a paternal inheritance b maternal inheritance c autosomal dominant type of inheritance or d both a paternal and maternal inheritance so pause think and then we'll discuss so fairly straightforward question the answer here is b maternal inheritance so just a fact-based question but we'll discuss a little bit about the mitochondrial inheritance so mitochondrial inheritance is always a maternal inheritance it is usually inherited from the mother's ovum because remember in fertilization most of the mitochondria of the sperm are shed or utilized and only the mother's ovum's mitochondria remains so mitochondrial diseases which comes from a mutation to the mitochondrial genome can only be derived from the mother's ovum so therefore remember m for m mitochondrial is always maternal in origin and remember in mitochondrial diseases all the children born to a mother affected by this condition will also be affected by the condition so all children will be affected by my uh, mitochondrial genome inheritance pattern irrespective of whether it is a male child or a female child so we know the x-linked diseases are slightly more predisposed to coming in males but remember especially the x-linked recessive but remember mitochondrial diseases all children from an affected mother are affected so let's look at the pedigree chart because this is the most important and most quizzed part of mitochondrial inheritance so here let's look at the first this half of the chart so you have a mother who has a mitochondrial genome disease okay and you notice that all children are affected so black is affected round is circle and square is male most of you know that for those who don't know i've just mentioned so all the shaded ones are affected so you can see a mother that is affected gave rise to all the children that are affected so it's 100 percent in the next generation comes up as 100 percent in the next generation and then you can see the male children that, that are affected gave rise to normal children whereas the female children that are affected gave rise to again all children with this condition now let's look at a situation where there's a male affected with a mitochondrial disease so you can see that this male gave rise to no children that have this mitochondrial disease so affected males do not transmit the disease whereas affected females transmit it to all children so once more look carefully at the pedigree chart very high yield very important all children are affected from a woman so this woman gave rise to two this woman two so all children born from a female suffering from mitochondrial disease also end up suffering from that and usually it usually occurs due to a mutation in the mitochondrial genome so the first cases here had some mutation to the mitochondrial genome so if a man's mitochondrial genome is mutated it will not transmit to his children but if it, if a woman's is all her children will have it so no sexual predilection either so just clearing up mitochondrial diseases took a little time but it's important to understand it now coming to a few of the important diseases you have the kss syndrome or kern sive syndrome lay disease the most important one Leber hereditary optic neuropathy melas it's a condition where you have some myopathies encephalopathy and also some seizures again narp something similar to that ophthalmoplegia and pearson disease so there's a mnemonic k l m n o p okay k l m n o p so k l m n o n p none of these diseases are really important they are never asked what's important is the pedigree chart and understanding that it is a maternal inheritance and of course Leber hereditary uh, neuropathy is or optic neuropathy is asked in ophthal more not in genetics so most important just remember the hereditary pattern of this condition let's go to question number two for today right so which of the following amino acids is necessary for the conversion of norepinephrine to epinephrine a tyrosine b tryptophan c phenylalanine or D methionine so pause think and then we will discuss so I'm including a lot of questions from biochemistry because most of you are repeatedly asking for that it's mainly biochem and pharmac so another topic that I found interesting from the tyrosine phenylalanine chapter is what amino acid is necessary for the conversion of norepinephrine to epinephrine let's look at the 
pathway and come back so catechol amine synthesis fairly important okay so it starts with phenylalanine remember phenylalanine is a aromatic amino acid just like tyrosine and tryptophan so phenylalanine under the influence of phenyl phenylalanine hydroxylase gives rise to tyrosine which can go for thyroid synthesis or catecholamine synthesis so phenylalanine under the influence of the enzyme phenylalanine thyroxy uh, phenyl phenylalanine hydroxylase and tetrahydrobiopterin give rise to tyrosine tyrosine is then further hydroxylated by tyrosine hydroxylase again under the influence of tetrahydrobiopterin to give rise to l dopa l dopa is decarboxylated so it loses a co2 to form dopamine under the influence of vitamin b6 b or pyridoxine or pyridoxyl phosphate okay pyridoxyl pyrophosphate very important coenzyme so decarb this decarboxylation and decarboxylation is again uses b6 as a coenzyme then dopamine is converted to norepinephrine again with cofactor being ascorbic acid which is vitamin c which gets dehydro de dehydrogenated to give dehydrogenated vitamin c under the influence of dopamine hydroxylase so dopamine converted to norepinephrine by dopamine hydroxylase then norepinephrine is converted to epinephrine by n methyl transferase which means there's a methyl group being transferred and the transfer occurs from s adenosyl methionine also called sam to homocysteine so sam or methionine is converted to homocysteine to give rise to epinephrine so once more phenylalanine under the influence of phenylalanine hydroxylase with tetrahydrobiopterin gives tyrosine tyrosine under tyrosine hydroxylase again tetrahydrobiopterin as cofactor gives rise to l dopa l dopa loses a co2 under the influence of dopa decarboxylase to give rise to dopamine cofactor being b6 dopamine is converted to norepinephrine cofactor vitamin c under the influence of dopamine hydroxylase so you can see there are three hydroxylase enzymes okay then you have norepinephrine to epinephrine under the influence of methyl transferase enzyme and here s adenosyl methionine is converted to s adenosyl homocysteine or methionine is converted to homocysteine so the question was what is necessary for the conversion of norepinephrine to epinephrine so a little trick here you know whenever we see catecholamines we always think of uh, sorry we always think of tyrosine and phenylalanine so we are in confusion we are in doubt and you would all, all obviously just start thinking about these two but the question is not what which amino acid is required for the formation of these catecholamines but the question is which is which amino acid is required for the step of norepinephrine to epinephrine and the amino acid which is important for this conversion is methionine we said sam is converted to sa or s adenosyl methionine is converted to s adenosyl homocysteine so methionine is important so the answer for this question is d methionine now let's go to the next question so scabies in neonates differs from that of adults in the fact that it affects a genitalia b axilla c face or d wrist okay so scabies differs in adults and neonates depending on where it involves so a genitalia b axilla c face and d wrist pause think and then we will discuss so the here the answer is sorry here the answer is c face okay so c face now we will discuss so sites of involvement of scabies is a fairly high yield topic fairly important so scabies varies in its involvement or site of involvement in children and in neonates or infants oh, sorry in adults and in neonates or infants so in adults scabies usually affects the interdigital web spaces okay so this is the most important thing this is the most high yield point among scabies in adults it's something that affects the interdigital web spaces you usually see burrows in the interdigital web spaces it can also affect the trunk the genitalia the neck or the skin over the neck rather the wrist elbow axilla and it's usually more common over the flexor aspect of the body and the limbs okay and palms and soles are usually spared spared so they are not involved usually in adults so once more interdigital web spaces trunk genitalia neck wrist elbow axilla and more common over the flexor aspect of the limbs now this region or this distribution is something called the circle of hebra okay so i'm going to draw the circle here so you can see scabies in adults presence within the circle of hebra as it's seen in this image so again interdigital web spaces most important palms rarely involved wrist elbow axilla areola trunk axilla areola trunk 
genitalia very important sometimes sexually transmitted scabies is also there and that is in the genitalia sometimes over the knees and ankle also and rarely also in the buttocks region but mostly remember it's in the anterior aspect of the body or the ventral aspect of the body and these are the common areas it's also called the circle of hebra which denotes these common areas now let's look at neonates so, or infants and in neonates and infants it usually presents on the face the scalp and also can involve the palms and the soles palms of the upper limb and soles of the lower limb so face scalp palms and soles can be usually involved and in adults it most commonly comes as burrows sometimes pustules uh, but in children it doesn't usually or in infants rather doesn't usually present as burrows but presents as pustules and vesicles so let's look at a few images very high yield so here you can see this is the interdigital web spaces and you can see a few burrows yeah a few burrows here and there it looks somewhat like that right so if you see a few burrows in the interdigital web spaces and here you can see it in a neonate you can see that the face is involved of course all the other sides can also be involved but if you see involvement of face uh, scalp and palms and soles you should think more on a neonate or an infant basis so again you can see that the face is also involved and it's not the typical burrows that you see here it's more of these pustules and vesicles so that was about the different distribution of scabies now let's talk about the last question for today the main apolipoprotein for ldl is the main apolipoprotein for ldl is a apo a1 a b apo b58 c apo b100 or d apo e so pause think then we will discuss so, so before we talk about the answer let's talk a little bit about apolipoproteins and what carries these proteins okay or why these proteins are important rather okay so apolipoproteins are proteins that bind to lipids okay apolipoproteins are proteins that bind to lipids and this binding is required for the transport of lipids through the lymphatic and circulatory system so we know that lipids are hydrophobic right usually lipids are hydrophobic so they cannot be transported in the blood and lymphatic system so what happens is certain proteins come and bind called apoproteins so, so apoproteins are proteins that come and bind to these lipids to form apolipoproteins and then these lipids become hydrophilic or their outer part becomes hydrophilic and they can be transported in blood and lymphatics so lipids are hydrophobic cannot directly be transported in blood and lymphatics therefore certain proteins called apoproteins bind to them to form apolipoproteins which can now be transported in the lymphatic and circulatory system to different parts of the body so the main purpose of having these apolipoproteins is for transportation so they are basically transportation proteins so there are four important types you need to know about firstly the chylomicrons then you have the vldl or the very low density lipoprotein then you have the ldl or low density lipoprotein and lastly you have the hdl or high density lipoproteins some books also in mention something called idl which stands for intermediate density lipoprotein so again chylomicrons vldl ldl and hdl so i would recommend that you remember it in this order and remember as you go from chylomicron to hdl the size of these reduces so chylomicron is the largest and hdl is the smallest so as you go down the size decreases and so does the lipid content so chylomicrons have the highest lipid content and as you keep coming down the percentage of lipid content reduces so hdl has least lipid content and the protein content as you go down increases so hdl is mainly protein slightly more than 50% protein so protein content rate increases whereas the size decreases as you come down from chylomicron to hdl so what are these chylomicrons so chylomicrons are the 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 uh, are the mode by which lipids are transported from the intestine to the rest of the body so lipid is absorbed from the intestine as lipid droplets and these lipid droplets are then converted into chylomicrons and they are mainly composed of apo b48 so with apolipoprotein apo b48 these lipid droplets are transported in blood to different parts of the body so from the intestine via lympha it's absorbed via lymphatics and then goes into the blood and then is transported to the rest of the body for each tissue to use lipids after that the remain, re remaining lipids are called remnant chylomicrons and these remnant chylomicrons then are taken back to the liver and are taken into the liver via the ldl receptors so chylomicrons 
they absorb the lipid droplets absorbed from the intestine are then transferred to lymph to form by uh, forming chylomicrons then from lymphatics it goes to blood and from blood it circulates to the rest of the body and after the body utilized the lipids as necessary the remaining lipids called remnant chylomicrons are then transferred to the liver and then taken into the liver via the ldl receptors now let's talk about what happens in the liver so three important chylomicrons you should know about now vldl ldl and idl vldl ldl and idl very low density low density and intermediate density lipoproteins they are mainly composed of apo b100 and they are important in trans transferring lipids from the liver to the tissue so if you remember you might have learned this as bad cholesterol because it increases the lipid deposition in the periphery especially for atherosclerosis it, uh, this is a very important pathological factor so these proteins or these apolipoproteins they they take lipids from the liver and deposit it to other sites or other organs in the body so these are important for transfer from liver to the tissue so remember only the vldl is produced by the liver okay only vldl is produced by the liver among these three the other two are actually produced in the plasma so the liver produces vldl and this vldl is then go, goes out of the liver okay to transport lipids obviously so vldl produced by the liver goes out of the liver and at the tissue level it's acted upon by tissue lipases and they these tissues then take free fatty acids either for energy or for adipose tissue synthesis or for adipose storage and the remaining after the vldl is treated by lipase you will get intermediate density lipoprotein and this idl in circulation over time is converted into ldl so vldl is converted to idl and idl to ldl by tissue level lipases so only vldl was produced by the liver among these three now let's talk about hdl something we used to call good cholesterol so hdl actually takes lipids from the periphery and brings it to the liver so from the tissue to the liver and therefore it's considered as good cholesterol because again it it prevents tissue or fat deposition in the peripheries especially things like atherosclerosis in the vessel wall so lipids from the tissue to the liver by hdl or high density lipoprotein and it's mainly composed of apo a1 so apo lipoprotein a1 or apo a1 is the main component of hdl and this scavenges lipids from the periphery and brings it back to the liver again this is also produced by the liver so remember vldl and hdl are produced by the liver and it only produces these two uh, uh, apolipoproteins now again quick review chylomicrons contain mainly apo b48 and apo e especially apo e is more common in the remnant chylomicrons okay so chylomicrons apo b48 and apo e VLDL, IDL and LDL have APO B100, HDL has APO A1. Now let's go back and answer the question. So the main APO lipoprotein in LDL is APO B100. So we said VLDL, LDL and IDL are mainly composed of APO B100, APO B48 in chylomicrons and APO A1 was more common in HDL. So that's it for today's discussion. Hope things were clear. A uh, lot of biochem is coming in because of requests okay but we'll try and discuss a few clinical questions in the coming uh, discussions because we haven't discussed anything clinical in a while so see you guys and uh, yeah bye